Well, good morning, Daily Bible Time. Dominic Steele here for a Monday morning, and we're working through Glenn Scrivener's list of passages not to speak on on Christmas Day. And uh, he's really said, here's 10 passages that no one speaks on on Christmas Day. And uh, I'm working through them to work out which one I might speak on on Christmas Day. We're up to his third one. And the third passage that Glenn selects uh, as something you wouldn't preach on on Christmas Day is the slaughter of the innocence passage. Uh, in Matthew chapter 2. Terrified mother cowers in a darkened corner, muffling the cries of her small infant, while around her the chaos and horror of Herod's slaughter of the children of Bethlehem rages. That's a description of a picture, a painting from the slaughter of the innocents. It's a graphic picture, a graphic description of what happens in Matthew 2, where the despotic, cruel king murders the innocent little baby boys of Bethlehem. And it's scene three of chapter two of Matthew's gospel. And King Herod works out he's been deceived by the Magi. And verse 16, Herod, when he saw that he'd been outwitted by the wise man, flew into a rage. He gave orders to massacre all the male children in and around Bethlehem who were two years old and under, in keeping with the time he'd learned from the wise man. Now, I think the early first 15 verses of the chapter probably happened very quickly, probably within 24 hours. Remember, Bethlehem is only eight kilometers from Jerusalem. It wouldn't have taken King Herod that long to work out that he'd been deceived. And then this awful massacre in verses 16, 17, and 18. And just to give you a bit of background, though, um, in the third scene, when Herod massacres the babies, in Matthew chapter 2, there's a quote from Jeremiah. Now, Jeremiah, Old Testament prophet, he's earlier than Hosea or Micah. And Jeremiah worked, I suppose, in the downward slope of the fortunes of Israel, of doom and gloom. He was one of the prophets who announced warnings from God about the punishment that will follow to Israel if you keep rejecting God. But there is hope after the promised doom and gloom. And so there are sections of the prophecy of Jeremiah that actually just drip with hope. And so if I read to you from chapter 31 of Jeremiah, at that time, this is the Lord's declaration. I will be the God of all the families of Israel. They'll be my people. This is what the Lord says. They found favor in the wilderness. The people who survived the sword. When Israel went to find rest, the Lord appeared to him from far away. I've loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, I continue to extend faithful love to you. Again, I will build you so you will be rebuilt, virgin Israel. You'll take up your tambourines again. You'll go out in joyful dancing. You'll plant vineyards again on the mountains of Samaria. The planters will plant and enjoy the fruit. And at the end of the chapter, though the prophet is talking about the devastation of the exile, the punishment, and then there'll be a bright future after that. So verse 38, look, the days are coming, the Lord's declaration, when the city from the Tower of Hanel to the corner gate will be rebuilt for the Lord. A measuring line will once again stretch out on straight to the hill of Garib and then turn towards Goa. The whole valley, the corpses, the ashes, and all the fields as far as the Kidron Valley to the corner of the horse gate to the east will be holy to the Lord. It will never be uprooted or demolished again. So it is a promise of great hope. But before we get to the great hope, there'll be an exile. So a couple of verses earlier, chapter 31 of Jeremiah, verse 15. This is what the Lord says. A voice was heard in Ramah, a lament with bitter weeping, Rachel weeping for her children, refusing to be comforted for her children because they are no more. Now, Rachel, metaphorically, she's the mother of Israel. And when she weeps for her children who will be no more, she's weeping because, because her children will be separated from the land, cut off from the land, sent into exile uh, before the hope in verse 18 follows following there's devastation in verses 15 so if you put jeremiah 31 15 in context that this sentence like the very next one 31 16 this is what the lord says keep your voice from weeping and your eyes from tears for the reward for, for your work will come this is the lord's declaration your children will return from the enemy's land there is hope for your future this is the lord's declaration your children will return to their own territory it's a sentence which says, yes, there's tears now, devastation now, but the good stuff, that's coming, that's about to come, the exile's about to end. And I think that's what Jeremiah wrote when he wrote this prophecy. I think he was thinking of some kind of physical fulfillment of the prophecy when the people of Israel might come back to Jerusalem. But why? 
does Matthew quote it here in Matthew chapter 2 verse 16 why does he quote Jeremiah 31 15 let me read it to you Herod saw that he'd been tricked by the Magi he became enraged sent and slew all the male children who were in Bethlehem and in the vicinity from two years old and under according to the time that had been determined from the Magi then what had been spoken through Jeremiah the prophet was fulfilled here's the quote a voice was heard in Ramah weeping and great mourning Rachel weeping for her children but she refused to be comforted because they were no more I think this sentence that Matthew chooses here in his gospel in chapter 2 is really significant because when you look back to Jeremiah it's the sad sentence out of the happy chapter I think Matthew really identifies well with the tears and desperateness of the parents of Bethlehem as they see their little two-year-old boys taken away to be murdered by King Herod but he's saying it's the sadness that comes on the way to the good the tears of the exile are reaching their climax there had been physical exile that the Jews went into for 70 years and I think physically the exile ended 70 years after it began but spiritually the Jews were in disgrace for much longer they were still in God's bad books when Jesus came on the scene they're still in spiritual exile at the start of Matthew, at the start of Matthew 2. And in fact, the sadness, the tears, the despair reaches their climax with the slaughter of the innocent children. But it's the sad sentence in the happy chapter. And what Matthew is saying is with Jesus, the exile is ending. With Jesus, there's great joy because the rescuer has come. The deliver, deliverer has come. The hope has come. The ruler has come. The king has come. Well, would you preach it on Christmas Day? Well, not in 2020, because I did preach it on Christmas Day in 2017 and 2012 and 2008. And I think it's a great passage to preach on on Christmas Day, because no one is expecting it. It grounds Christmas not in a fairy tale, but in the reality of the sinful, awful world where terrible things happen. And the theme of Saviour and Lord just glistens through this narrative so I say yes preach on this passage on Christmas Day but not village this year and uh, we're looking at passage number four from Glenn Scrivener's list tomorrow morning Tuesday morning on Daily Bible Time see you then